<laughs> Where's the red light? No, I'm gonna just. You know what? I've got. A, Are you ready? I've got. A, I'm I'm you ready. Know. <laughs> we need to try and do as writers is learn how to maneuver along the edges of sentimentality. If you are writing in what we call sentimentality, where you make generalized, over-the-top statements, you leave the body. I think you gotta take some risks if you're good at it. Otherwise, you know you're being sentimental about all these rules you learned from your favorite professor. Right? You look at American writing. I think of George Saunders, who I complained about a lot, but he's all over the place. Sometimes he's sentimental as hell. Sometimes he's absolutely not. You know. Okay, the Acme Writing Academy is on the air, coming to you from Acme Broadcast Headquarters in Venice Beach, California. This is Rick Crisman along with Mike Magnuson, Jim Frank, Bob Clark, and last but not least, our man in Argentina, Marcello Vasquez. All of us thanking you, the listener, for eavesdropping in. All right, I want to read a little something to introduce tonight's topic, and then uh, off we'll go. Writing students everywhere have been warned to avoid sentimentality, which some would say has resulted in an MFA-curated style of writing that has become excessively stoic, clever, or ironic in its attempt to dance around the expression of raw emotion. But what is it we're even talking about when we're talking about sentimentality? Uh, uh, Jim Frank, what are your thoughts about this? Well, when we were uh, talking about this over the last couple of weeks, uh, I recalled that there's a, actually a really good debate in the New York Times from almost three years ago about uh, sentimentality. And it's, uh, it's in the bookends uh, section of the New York Times. And Zoe Heller and uh, Leslie Jameson talk about it and i think that one of the things that we sort of gather from that article and some of the various places that we've uh considered definitions of sentimentality is generally speaking it's emotion that's uh not earned and what we have is we have a situation in in a story or in an anecdote or in a poem where the writer demands that we feel a particular emotion but in effect there is no correlative. I mean, there's no source for that emotion, only the request to feel. One of the things that I liked about this uh, column is, uh, is that Roland Barthes made this uh, claim a long time ago, and it was, it is no longer the sexual that is indecent, and what he means by that is the sexual in literature. It is the sentimental. And I think what he's trying to get at is that everything becomes clever and ironic in the earnest and the the real emotion tends to disappear. Yeah, Jim, you know, that is a good article. And I think uh, our, our readers or our listeners rather would uh, enjoy reading it. And to find it, just Google, should writers avoid sentimentality? And it'll pop right up. Okay, Mike Magnuson, over to you. I, I think it in, involves avoiding overblowing emotions. And I think I think something when we talk about proving it and making it real, I, th- I think what they mean by sentimentality is you just don't come out and say something. You don't say you're sad. You physically prove it through the world. Yeah, you know, you know, Flannery O'Connor once said, you, you have to put it in the body. And if you don't earn it through the body, if you generalize something that, is, that can be felt or is it much more complex than just one simple idea then you're being sentimental or you're writing sentimentally. You know, this isn't to say there isn't a sentiment. This doesn't mean we don't laugh or, you know, we cry even in literature that isn't sentimental because we have felt this thing. But I think it's about forcing it. So sentimental sentimentality then has something to do with oversimplification. Stereotype maybe? Definitely. I think that's really the case. It's this, uh, Oversimplification to get sort of a one-dimensional emotion from your audience. I think one of the things that we probably recognize in literature that we would not call sentimental is that when there is a scene where there's emotion that's generated, if it's sentimental, it's usually trying to get just one feeling from you, like sadness or esteem or a sort of feeling of loss or something like that. When I think in the best works of literature... A particular scene will try to elicit a whole range of emotions that no scene is particularly one emotion that you can feel both sad and, you know, feel kind of good that maybe that's happening and still at the same time pity the person who's suffering. And I think that's that's when we're talking about sentimentality. It's that oversimplification that you pointed out, Rick, that 
people who have sort of a more established taste for literature, more established taste for narrative, begin to recognize. But I think people fear having emotional moments in their writing because they fear that they're going to be accused of being sentimental. You know, I found this from Frank Herbert today, that the difference between sentiment and sentimentality is easy to see. When you avoid killing someone's pet on the glazeway, I think that's driveway, that's sentiment. So when you avoid killing someone's pet on the driveway, that is sentiment. If you swerve to avoid the pet, and that causes you to kill pedestrians, that is sentimentality. Bob Clark, what do you think? I think sentimentality comes into play when uh, the writer hasn't done a good job of developing his characters. If you have good character development, you don't need to rely on cliches and, and the need to try and and reel sympathy or tears or whatever out of the reader. But I go back to what uh, Oscar Wilde said about it. The sentimentalist is one who desires the luxury of emotion without paying for it. In other words, you've done a lousy job of developing your characters. You're, you're actually showing disdain for your characters when you think you have to write stuff to draw the reader's emotions out. The reader should be allowed to just come out with his own emotions because you've, you've set somebody out there that is important to them. You know, you hear all the time, if you're raised religiously, that, that God doesn't interfere in man's life. He, he's given us free will or whatever. So if you're going to play God writing the fiction and writing characters, you have to then be like God, develop them, write them well, and keep that that distance of allow them their own foibles. And yeah, if you've done your work, you know, the reader's going to be right in there with you. And when you're writing things that should make people feel bad, you don't have to use language to make them feel bad. What's happening to the character at the time is enough. But you have to have a good character. Marcello, I see you scratching your head there. I think, I think, yeah, I think a writer has to consider a lot of what genre, and I hate word genre. Well, what form are you going to be writing in, I guess? You mentioned David Foster Wallace. Yeah. And Infinite Jest. Sure. Which is satire. It's a, it's, it's a satirical masterpiece. So, But there are moments in there where it's the sentimentality or the sentiment that the writer or the author is projecting through different choices that he's making as a writer. So it could, it could be through characterization. It could be switching from one type of voice to the other. I was thinking about Flannery Connor's story, Good Country People All Day Today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at the end of the story. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, I know some bad shit's going to happen. If, if you're following this podcast, then the ending doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. I think uh, what what happens is uh, she builds this expectation that Holga is going, or, you know, her name is actually Joy, is going to run off with Manly Pointer, and they end up in that hayloft, right? Yeah. And he wants he wants to have a look at her leg, right? And, uh, you know, rather than having this turn out to be that moment where Holga finds her joy and her true love, you know, and we have that happy ending. He takes a leg and gets out of there and reveals himself just to be a con man, right? And right. so I think, you know, what she's doing is she's messing very much with sentiment and sentimentality in that very story, particularly at the ending. She uh, layers uh, the entire story with uh, cliché and insincere opinions and judgments about others which actually gets people into trouble in that they end up uh, believing things that aren't really true. And I think that story really is a great example of how one can let sentimentality in a fictional world or even the real world cloud your judgment in such a way that you feel like you're feeling something, but what you discover is what you were feeling wasn't true at all. And that's why the ending of that story is so great. Oh, yeah. She, she totally undercuts your expectations. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's that's it. Sentimentality story. is the expected thing, the obvious. It's a beautiful thing. story, even though right. horrible things happen. Right, <laughs> and but that's the complexity I was talking before, about. Before you were saying something about how it 
It's a distortion of something. Well, I, I she says it's a distortion of sentiment. That somehow you know, it seems so odd that she would say that since she's associated with grotesquery. You know, she's writing a a, a, a grotesque uh, um, gothic fiction. Everybody says this, where her characters are exaggerated. You know, Hazel Moats and 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 Wise Blood. There's nobody like that who's stupid enough to believe a. a you know, like the what well, he's running around with an icon. You remember that? And he talks to yeah. the gorilla, the guy in the gorilla suit, and believes he's in a gorilla. Yes. I know he's that stupid. This is this is overblown. It's ridiculous. Is that is that sentimentality or not? I mean, it's funny. Go ahead, Bob. What you were uh, talking? I, I have a question. Yeah. And w- what part does culture play in here in this country play in our rejection of sentimentality? Is it accepted more in other cultures in their writing? Or is it a or is it a universal taboo, Marcello? I would. It's such a very very good question. In Latin America, well, Argentina, the word is sentimiento, and what a sentimiento means, it's like a feeling, right? How an attitude towards something, right? So I go, what's your sentimiento? How do you feel about this? Sentimentalidad is sentimentality. So. For example, if you're if you're in a if you're giving a speech or you're you know you're the best man at a wedding, and you're expected that your speech should be sentimental, so yeah. then yes. the audience yes. expects you to be pretty fucking good at it. So it's not like yeah. it's taboo. If you put out sentiment, you put out sentiment. If you are going to be in the situation, I guess it matters. It's the occasion is recognized. If the occasion calls for. It. Paul's so you're saying that there are moments in narrative where the occasion merits sentimentality. I guess. I, I'm just saying it's not taboo. I mean, that's why, you know, South American writers are so versatile. They're virtuosos. And they continue to be. Because you don't have these taboos that are coming out of the MFA programs or workshops. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you wonder if a sentimental writer is such a bad writer, is he ever going to get read anyway? You know what I mean? If you can't mm-hmm. develop characters and all that. You're expected to do everything. And even in the society, right? You know, you, you know who's a good speaker and who isn't. You know when to put the irony on and when not to. Yeah, I would, I would, I would say certainly in that culture that I'm familiar with, it's recognized as what it is. How, how much do you think the general reading public recognizes sentimentality if it's on the page, if, if people – like us who, who study this stuff and do write, uh, we're so aware of it. Then how about, you know, Joe Bag of Donuts picking up a book because he just wants a good summer read on a, on a Sunday afternoon? Right. Do they recognize that? Is it a, a big, a, big of a taboo to the reader as it is to us as the writer? I think to many writers, or to many readers it isn't, but I mean, I think that if we're going to have a podcast talking about something like this then we're kind of presuming that people are trying to figure out how to how to do this and i think leslie jameson uh who's a who's a writer talked about sentimentality says that one of the things that i think that we need to try and do as writers is learn how to maneuver along the edges of sentimentality in courageously emotive stories so i mean we want to generate emotion right of course of course We, we want to uh, make the reader feel, but we also want to avoid acquiring them, as you said, Bob, cheaply, you know, without earning them. And I think, you know, one of the things that Marcello mentioned, I think is something that I've been thinking a lot about this week as well. I wonder sometimes if sentimentality in the hands of some writers is just another rhetorical strategy for showing us characters or showing us, you know, perhaps something that might be part of a narrator's inauthenticity or unreliability, you know, a narrator who gets sentimental over something that that narrator shouldn't be sentimental about uh, tells us something about that narrator. So the writer is, I think you rightly pointed out, Marcello, you better be able to produce sentimentality in your writing if you're going to be a good writer because your characters will be sentimental at times. Oh, that's a great point. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, I think I think it's a difficult thing to negotiate. But I, I think, Bob, if you know, yeah, readers 
love that sentimentality all the time. And uh, I think, you know, that's to a certain extent what separates popular literature from maybe something that might be more highbrow, which I think gets into something that Mike was talking about uh, when it comes to a sort of class-based issue when it comes to sentimentality. I, I've been wondering about this too. Is it, it seems like the, the discussion about this, you know, when you, when you think of it in terms of a, a rhetorical strategy to, to use sentimentality or not, it's just another tool in the toolbox. Yeah. And, and, and I, it, it's curious that at least in America, when the, uh, the idea of avoiding sentimentality came really to the fore, you know, through the uh, John Gardner and through the uh, agrarians, the new formalists of the South, Clant Brooks and uh, Robert Penn Warren and, and the rest of the gang. They were coming up with this at a time when uh, creative writing was formulated into something we teach in the university. So when you're trying to teach somebody how to write, you got to think, what are the most important things we need? We need, you know, rich characters and the rich characters have to be t- built through detail and we shouldn't uh, uh, use abstractions when because we can't build uh, rich characters with abstractions and so forth. And the, the, the core the core element of this, in, in my view, is that John Gardner is talking about that vivid, continuous dream. So when you read a book, you're supposed to be watching a movie, essentially, or a play or feeling the experience that a, that a character felt. And, and truly, if that's what the goal of the fiction is, you cannot do this unless it's all rendered in terms of the body, almost in, in method acting terms, where nothing comes into the narrative that isn't borne out by an action. We can see it. There is no emotion that doesn't appear unless it is physically manifested. Right. right. And, and this is a thing that all writers need to learn. Now, this isn't necessarily a thing that all writers need to do all the time. But in order to write to the vivid, continuous dream, you have to master that technique. If you are writing in what we call sentimentality, where you make generalized over the top statements, you leave the body. You know, we talked about this earlier that it has something to do. You leave the body. You're saying Henry was sad. And then you go, why? Do you see how that might work? Yeah, that yeah, this, yeah. But, but, but whether or not this is what was really tied to sentimentality or, or, you know, something to do with the emotions, like there are some emotions that have value over another, maybe that's not what it's about. Maybe it really is just a, a way to explain a technique that they couched in moral terms. Right. In order to teach writing at all, you have to somehow take these ephemeral things and quantify them in some way. And so one of the things that you quantify is this idea of, quote, unquote, sentimentality and then that becomes this thing that you do you learn not to do and it becomes prescriptive and so forth but okay okay so here's the question that this leads to is by saying <clears throat> by having this dictum against sentimentality do you think that this has dr- led to a kind of a trend of dry emotionless prose i think that the the, the bigger concern when you think of whether you know, worrying about sentimentality important or not is if you're going to become a writer, right? And you're being taught a set of techniques, you know, are you going to believe when you're told something that this is the way you should do it exclusively? And this is students do this all the time, right? You say, okay, well, you gotta, you're not going to put anything in your narrative that doesn't advance the action. Hell, I, 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 I taught with a colleague once who said you couldn't write a short story, a graduate teacher who you couldn't write a short story in this person's class, if you didn't have four scenes and it had to have a beginning and a middle and an end and it had to follow the verities, right? You couldn't go back in time because nothing should happen that isn't borne out by an action and sequence. So people become to believe this as a matter of dogma. Right. It's not. You know, that that that's the thing. So, like, if you look at American writing, I think of George Saunders, who I complain about a lot, but he's all over the place. Sometimes he's sentimental as hell. Sometimes he's absolutely not, you know, the David Foster Wallace, you know, any Leslie Jameson, you know, she's running on absolutely all cylinders at all times. If for somebody who wants to rise up to her level, you have to think, well, do I have to not do this because my teachers told me to? And, and if that's the case, why am I agreeing with them? And you might, you might think that they're right. And you might decide to write that way. That would be totally cool. I, th- I think that for myself, at least, 
I do wonder sometimes if sentimentality is a question of taste as well, and that we we pretend to prefer certain types of sentimentality over other types of sentimentality. And I think sometimes, right, when we're looking at, you know, stuff that comes out of workshops and we look at things that come out of writers who are trying to avoid sentimentality, is that it tells us more about the writer's feelings about literature which to a certain extent are sentimental. If the writer doesn't run the risk of being sentimental or being called sentimental, then sometimes I think the writer is sentimental about these rules about not being <laughs> sentimental. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, I think I think you got to take some risks if you're good at it. Otherwise, you know, you're being sentimental about all these rules you learned from your favorite professor in grad school. And you know, you're you're you're, you're adhering to them because you know, damn it, Jim Whitehead was a great guy, and he told me never to be sentimental. But, you know, Jim Whitehead, one of my favorite professors of all time, I mean, uh, I got to spend a week in Rome with him, and uh, we went around looking at Bernini's uh, sculptures throughout Rome. And um, he, Wow, that's he, so he, great. That's he, so great. We, we were sitting in the, you know, the church where St. Teresa and Ecstasy is at, and we're looking at it. And, you know, he's sitting there and he's getting all weepy about it. And then he leans over to me and he says, he says to me, he said, Frank, tell me she ain't having a fucking orgasm. (laughs) 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 And I mean, you know, the the moment of sentimentality is completely and totally eliminated at that moment. (laughs) I I got all weepy right there. But uh, yeah. imagining the, but you know, the orgasm. Of course, he's being sentimental. <laughs> <laughs> it is pure sentiment, isn't it? It's been so long. But I mean, <laughs> orgasm, nostalgic. <laughs> orgasm. <laughs> you remember the day when you could? <laughs> they, 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 they probably share the same root in Greek. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Orgasm is romantic. Exactly. But I think, I think, I think the 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 point is, is I think that. The larger point I'm trying to make is if we try too hard not to be sentimental in our writing, then we're sort of glorifying and deifying the rules that we got in grad school rather than taking chances about writing something that might be emotional and might really grab the reader in ways that, you know, causes ecstasy or orgasm. Is that so wrong? No. You know, I don't know if you got you guys know the book Life After Life, Kate uh, Atkins, Atkinson. You know that one? Where no, each chapter is a, a girl being born, and then she's going to kill Hitler, but oh, I've she, heard about this. she dies. Each chapter she dies, and wow, then she, the like next really chapter she's yeah. born again, and circumstances are slightly different, but she, still she dies, right? And we that's know always the way it is. And, and and it's I'll tell you it's one of the greatest books I've ever read, and wow, okay, it's really really well written. But it's sentimental because every chapter they've got you increasingly loving this little girl and they kill her off every fucking chapter. Nice. I'm telling you, at the end, you're at the end of each chapter, you're devastated because of the the weird thing that's happened. She drowns or she falls <laughs> off the roof or whatever. But you know the very first chapter, the very first chapter is her walking into a cafe and shooting Hitler. That does sound really good. It does. You know, Clark was talking about the audience before. You know, like what what do people really want to read? You know, mm-hmm. and and I think you know we talk about what we're doing as writers who are focusing on our craft, and then you're thinking about the general public, which they want they want sentimentality jeepers. That's what everything is. You know, like you know, it's it's all overblown. You think of anything on that that's popular on television or in books. It's, it's got a sentimental base, you know? So yep. if we're trained in this art where we are going to write realistically, we're going to avoid sentimentality and so forth, we got to understand that we're going to apply this to an environment where everybody wants us to do something else. So we can use these techniques to come into human beings and render them, you know, in and, and whatever way that makes them believable and we can earn the truth. And at the same time, we can get to an audience who wants that sentimental experience. 
They want the they want to weep. They want to get the hankies out. They want to be shocked. They want to be mortified, you know, or any number of the things you might experience when you read a novel. They want to feel. But I think you're getting at the point I was making about complexity. I mean, at first, there's that first feeling, you know, like when you drink a good glass of wine, you might feel it on your tongue, right in the middle of your tongue. And then afterwards, you notice that, you know, there's a sort of acid and uh, sort of uh, tannin feel on the sides of your tongue and, and that sort of thing. And I think that, sure, we want to have right things that that grab people and make them feel but we don't want it to be one dimensional right we don't want it to be just one color and and i think that probably the best writers are the writers that grab us like that and we may not even know at the time that we're feeling something other than say sadness maybe we're feeling something else along with that and only on reflection do we begin to to sort out some of those other emotions that we're made to feel as well but I think sometimes when that happens, we know we read something that was, uh, you know, maybe unsettling, maybe disturbing, maybe really great. We may not know how to put it in words yet. I, I, I tend to trust that sort of emotional response where I can't put into words what I'm feeling, but I'm feeling something is being yeah. more authentic than something I know immediately. Oh, I'm feeling sad. I think I, I like that. I've always thought that a short story is something that can't the the feeling you get at the end of a story is something that can't be explained outside of the words of the story itself it's flyer connor yes she was pretty much if you can if you can summarize the story and in, in such a form that you give it its meaning you have failed as a writer that is to say the reader so they force you to read the story to get the full understanding or and that, that reminds me of, of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Heresy of the Didactic, which was, a, which was the controlling element, really, over the early American short story, where right. no matter what, this thing could not preach. It was supposed to come to almost like a, a poem comes to a moment at the end where it, it gives you an image. You don't really know what it means, but it means, you know, several things, right? And it allows for discussion. It allows for interpretation and so forth. Let me offer an example of a short story <clears throat> that is, uh, I, I think, is a good example of, of uh, sentimentality done well, and that's uh, James Joyce's uh, The Dead. If you read the end of that story with that snow falling like that, I mean, it's sentimental. It, it's sentimentality, but it just fucking hits the mark. It's an extraordinary story. I mean, for me, I... Lucky. I get a chill when I read the end of that story. I get I know, a chill up my, up my spine. I really This do. is, you know, my, my role is buzzkill, you know, on the planet. I'm going to confirm <laughs> it right now. I never got to the end of that story. That story is boring as fuck. I want, I want the oh. shit fan to come in and start shooting machine guns or something on page two. Magnuson, I worry for your soul. Christ, we're waiting for him to look into the snow. We're going to read 70 pages for him to look into the goddamn snow. <laughs> I got, I got the CNN on. They got disasters. It's pretty interesting. I was just trying to make my friends laugh. No, <laughs> <Ed Muskin. laughs> Listen, we're, we're starting to run long, so I want to reel it in a little bit. Uh, but I want to get to that this last business, which is kind of getting at what Magnuson's saying. And, and the question is, is there is there some kind of an elitism uh, built into this whole deal that that says that uh, oh inferior prose or poetry sort of wears its heart on its sleeve and appeals to less sophisticated readers who are not capable of parsing the greater complexity of human emotion? In other words, are are we by this no sentimentality rule? Are we saying we're above all this and this is our class of reader as opposed to the common man who reads, you know, 50 shades of gray or chiclet or whatever. I think this is a, a, a low and inside ball to Mike Magnuson. I don't know. I, I, I want, I want to hit the ball right back to the pitcher. I mean, you, you spent a, a career in, in music, you know, and like, you know more about music than anybody who's going to listen to the music you make. I mean, I, I, you know, whether you can deny it or not, you do sometimes when you're trying to be humble, you know, but like 
when you're among musicians talking about music, it's got to be a different conversation than among people who listen to music. Yep. And the same thing must be true of writers who are talking about writing as opposed to the readers of writing. You know, and I think the, yeah. the elite nature, the people, the critics who say that we have to do this and the writing teachers who are trying to save their jobs and maintain their authority and, you know, all the things that we all do, I think then we come up with that kind of a, a pecking order. I do not like literature. That's funny. I've heard this. I've heard this, you know, and that funny is a form of sentimentality. So you write funny stuff. You have potty humor. This is bad. You know, you, you go for a, a cheap cry in the first paragraph. Oh, you can't do that, you know. So why? You know, they say in the grammar, you know, that there's a grammar, and this the grammar applies to all language. But there's the usage where somebody says, you're supposed to say, of whom do I speak? Do you follow <laughs> right. what I mean? You don't right. have to. That's, that's not the grammar, you know. So... Yeah, so I, I think that I, I think I think elitism comes in where people are trying to apply a usage to uh, an idea, your sentiment. You know, they're trying to say, "Well, I'm holding the line for this one thing," and because I am, have gone to Harvard and learned a lot about literature, if I gone to Iowa or University of uh, North Carolina or whatever, because I know this stuff, I am an arbiter of it. I know better than those other people. Uh, you know, we all do it. Shit, I'm bitching about it right now, and I do it all the time too. So there you. Go. You know, what's always interesting to me is uh, um, there's there's sort of like these popular folk songs that people sing together. You know, whether they're at a family gathering or you know around a campfire or something like that. And you know, they're clearly sentimental songs. But what happens is the the performance of them gets attached to certain contexts and certain places. So that it's not the song that itself that's sentimental anymore. It's uh, the way the song is used to generate, you know, feelings of emotion and stuff like that. And, I, and, I, and I'm kind of interested to consider this idea of sentimentality being a form of rhetoric. Because I think, you know, when we th think about, for instance, appeals to emotion as a, as a rhetorical device. I mean, sometimes an appeal to emotion is a good thing to do in a piece of you know, literature or in a discursive piece of writing. So if that's the case, how is an appeal to emotion much different than sentimentality? I mean, it's trying to stoke some sort of particular feeling. And, you know, sometimes uh, that's a necessary thing to do uh, stylistically and uh, rhetorically. But I, I think that we're all kind of right to be kind of skeptical of it because we know that when people are made to feel too easily or moved to feel too easily that that's usually a way of obscuring some other sort of motive or design that a writer or a performer or an orator might have. And that's, that's, you know, being inauthentic and not truthful. You know, that's a, that's a way better summary that I could ever come up with. I'm going to, I'm going to just put it around the room for anybody with last comments and, uh, we're going to get along with our lives. Anybody? Well, I miss you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already pre-missing you. I'm feeling a little sentimental about this one. You can put this in anywhere. I just was thinking that at, at the end, I was thinking somewhere I'd go to read this wonderful stanza, the most wonderful sentimental stanza ever from uh, Casey at the Bat by Ernest Lawrence Thayer. You want to read it? Yes, I do. Let's have Think it. Of, this is sentimentality. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and little children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. <laughs> and with that... Sorry. We're, we're going to close the curtain on this episode of Acme Writing Academy. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to our luminaries, Marcello Vasquez, Jim Frank, Bob Clark, Mike Magnuson, your host, Rick Grisman, thanking you for listening in, and we'll see you next time.